Welcome back. Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast. We talk nothing but Raiders football. Ah, some food, some baseball, eh, every once in a while, some stuff. But anyway, welcome back to the show. We appreciate you guys being with us. Scott Branson, Mo Moten, your co-host for this adventure on this Thursday. Mo, the Raider Nation, been a tough week. Uh, if you look at these Twitter streets, as we call them, it looks like a scene from the movie The Purge. Lots of gnashing of teeth going on out there. I understand it. Nobody wanted to be one in four, even with uh, some of the tough com- opponents on the schedule. Uh, but here we are, and Raider Nation's got to get ready for a week off before the team gets out there and tries to change the direction of this season. Yes, yeah, Scott. One thing I learned covering the Raiders or covering any football team, not just specifically the Raiders, you don't want to hang around on Twitter after a bad loss. <laughs> yeah, because people you normally have cordial, normal discussions with, it turns into a bad thing. It's it just not a good thing oh, yes. after a loss. Uh, people people are super grumpy, and I get it. Uh, I don't wear the fan hat anymore, so I don't I don't really get emotional after losses. I don't get emotional after losses at all, win or lose. But I understand fans do. So that's why I kind of give fans that space. And I just kind of get off of Twitter. <laughs> of course, I was on with you and Murph on the post game. And we went back and forth. Of course, we had some disagreements. And it was all in great fun. And, you know, that's what happens when people have different opinions. And, sure. of course, we, res- we, res- we respect each other's opinions. But on of Twitter, course. you don't get that same respect. It's either – it's it's not, not either. It's I'm right, you're wrong, you're stupid – get off my Twitter account. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Block, yes. you know? So yes. I, I just choose not to hang around and uh, just kind of, kind of decompress and just kind of go over things before the Raiders go into their buy. Well, and, and that's a smart way to do it, but let's, let's spend this first segment talking a little bit, Mo, as we usually would do on a Tuesday after a Sunday game, but because of the Monday game, and that led into our Tuesday show. That was our instant reaction show. So let's spend this first segment, as you have done, as I have done, re-watching parts of this game and understanding what happened. But you look at it, and we talked about how the offense found more balance again, like they did against Denver in the win. But it was inconsistent again as well. We saw inconsistency on offense at times. Of course, they jump out to the 20 points in the first half, and then they can't score in the second half very often. You see this happen to the Raiders over and over again where they go into these offensive slumps. What did you see watching the tape for some of the reasoning on why they could not put up points in the second half? You know what? I I still can't even put my finger on it because Mm. it's kind of like – it's kind of like what you've seen this season where the Raiders come out and they have a they have a good half and all of a sudden the offense stalls. Derek Carr may be a little off on some passes. Uh, some plays aren't made. You know, and, and game, as, as, I, as I wrote in a recent piece on Sports Night after the game that NFL football sports, well, specifically football, is a game of inches. Oh, yeah. And sometimes the other team just makes more critical plays than your team. And the Raiders just didn't make critical plays. Uh, Josh Jacobs not getting into the end zone on a two point conversion. I know a lot of people want to talk about the decision, but I thought it was an understandable decision. Um, you have Josh Jacobs running for about, I believe, over seven yards of carry. So you think, you know, with the Raiders, the way the Raiders are moving the ball, that he can get in the end zone on a two point. Devontae Adams, who's usually one of the kings of the toe drag swag, couldn't get his <laughs> foot down. Uh, Because if he gets his foot down, the Raiders probably have a chance to kick a long field goal. Daniel Carlson hasn't missed a field goal this season, his longest from 55 yards. So if Devontae Adams comes in with that catch, uh, you have a chance. And then on the last play, Devontae Adams running into Hunter Renfro is just basically a summation of what the Raiders look like when they're bad. And they're just clunky, uh, clumsy, whatever word you want to use. But what I will say, what I will say is part of the collapse and what stuck out to me when I watched the game Missed tackles. And I don't know why this is, but the Raiders have had this problem for the past few years with missed yes. tackles. Yeah. Right now, they are top five in missed tackles with the Texans, the Ravens, the Titans, the Chiefs. And guess what all those teams have in common? They have mediocre to below average defenses. defenses. If you can't yep. tackle, if you can't tackle, you're going to give up a lot of yards. You're going to get up, give up a lot of points. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I, 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 it's interesting. We had some comments from our post-game video, one of which was, 
oh, you guys are so positive and 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 mis- you know they they wanted misery. People want the misery. And what we're trying to do here, and I thought you just did a great summation of what's wrong with the Raiders, partially what's wrong with the Raiders on offense and defense, which is on offense, they clearly have more talent and they're playing below the talent level at times. At other times, they're doing really well. We saw it early in that first half and what they were able to do. But the defense, the defense has does not have enough good bodies. It just we knew that going in. We knew about what happened on the defensive line. We knew there were some question marks at defensive back. The linebacker has been a black hole. Yes, Perryman plays okay and he's fine. He's doing well there. They signed Blake Martinez who didn't play, I believe. I didn't see him for one snap um in that game unless I missed it. Um and so there's gaps on that defense. They're just not that good on defense. And still, you might need a high-powered offense today in the NFL to win, but you also need a really good defense, and the Raiders just don't have it. So so I think this Raiders team is better, and some people would argue is better than the 1-4 and four record, I should say. Some people would argue you're not better than your record. You're either 1-4, and four, you're 4-1, four and one, whatever you are. But, Mo, we talked about it on the post game. I was a little more negative than you and Murph, and you brought me around on it, which is if you look at the closeness of the games, if they just play consistent football, not, not even tremendous football, just above average to their talent level and consistently do it, they probably at, at the very least would be 500 or around 500, three and two, something like that. Uh, but instead they find themselves at one and four because they just can't finish at times. So the Raiders are one and four. The Bears are going to their Thursday game at what is it, two and three? Right. And I asked this question to a person on Twitter: Who would you take to win a game between the Bears and the Raiders <laughs> if they play today? Right. So, are you saying that the Bears, because they're two and three, are better than Ra- Raiders record-wise? Yes, but are they a better football team than the Raiders? No, because if you watch the Bears, you know they are years, at least a year away from being competitive and competitive and making a, a push for a playoff spot right the raiders you see glimpses of really good yeah. the problem is you also see glimpses of really bad and and because they because they've played against some playoff caliber teams the chargers the cardinals all the titans the chiefs uh not so much the broncos yet because they're still a, to me they're still a wreck on offense but <laughs> for the most part the raiders have played against playoff caliber squads teams that are right. going to be in the playoff picture are going to be in the postseason and as i said after the game on monday when you're playing those types of teams those caliber teams you have to play closer to a complete game than not because if right. you slip up you make a mistake. You don't convert on a fourth down. You don't get a two-point conversion. You don't haul in a catch at the end of the game to get your team in field goal position. You're going to lose that game. And not because you were terrible. It's because the other team made more plays than you did. It doesn't make you a bad football team. It just means that you're just not as good as those teams. And I, and I just want to clear something up that I said on Monday. And, and I guess this is where the back and forth between you and I happened was – I guess the mis the misconstrument was how far are the Raiders away from being a playoff team? Yeah. And I guess your point was right now they're kind of maybe they're not as close as we thought. Mm. And and I understand that point because coming into the year, we thought, okay, you bring in Devontae Adams, you bring in Chandler Jones. His team was 10 and 7 last year, made it to the playoffs. It should be up from here, right? They should be in the playoff mix. And then when you start off one and four, you go. Well, how close or how far are they? Are we starting, yeah. not starting over, but are we taking a step back? Right. To take a step forward in 2023? I hope not. But it's fair to ask the question. No, it is. And and that's exactly what I was getting at because, and I think that's where the expectations, listen, for all of the pain and suffering that Raider Nation has been in the last 25 years, uh, it's still the most optimistic bunch I've ever seen. Right. So going into every season, they could be in full rebuild mode. And I think there's people who think they're going to make the playoffs and, and, and maybe even win the Super Bowl. And that's great. That shows you the enthusiasm, the love of the team, of their family that is Raider Nation. At the same time, you look at it from the perspective of realistic expectations. You and I had real, realistic expectations. I thought 11 wins. You thought 10 wins. We were in the same ballpark. Um, other people thought 14 win. I mean, there was there was such a high expectation of this team because they were a playoff team a year ago, but they went on that run at the end of the season 
to get them there. The breaks went their way a couple times too. You need that in a season. At the same time, Mo, um, you look at all of the change, and it's hard because it's not like it was a continuation of last year. I think we all got fooled into thinking it's a continuation of last year, and you're piling, okay, I got this cool car. Now I put new wheels on it. I put a new transmission in. I put a new uh, uh, radiator on it, whatever it is, and it's going to run better now, right? But what you don't realize is it takes time for that system. And again, you and I don't make excuses for this team ever. We're not fanboys. We're not wearing those glasses. But I will tell you, there is something to that. There is something to the fact that you have all of these new things, a new offense, a new coach, a new personality, all that together, I think they're tripping up on each other. Yes, they have a lack of talent in certain positions, and there's no question. But overall, I think it's that mix. It's that chef with the big wooden spoon, and and he's mixing, but it's just not together. The batter's not smooth and ready to roll yet. Scott? I'm going to go back in the time capsule when we did our prediction show. <laughs> how right? far? Yeah. How far the prediction show before the uh -huh. season started. I, as you said, you predicted 11 and six. I predicted 10 and seven. I looked into the YouTube comments and what did I see? Oh, Mo was always so negative. Oh, you, how you only got us at 10 and seven. We were 10 and seven last year. We added Devontae Adams, Chandler Jones. Now I get on the post game and I say, Hey, it's not doom and gloom. And now I'm too positive. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what people are looking for. I know. But this is why I tell young writers, young sports content makers, just go with your opinion, go yeah. with your judgment, and ride it out. Whatever right. that is. If you feel the need that you have to pivot, then pivot as you get new information. But do not listen to people telling you, oh, you're too positive, you're too negative, and adjust your commentary based on that. I base my commentary based on what I'm seeing. And as I said during the show. I said, I think the Raiders are going to have some trip ups early. I, I, if I remember correctly, you had the Raiders starting off pretty strong and I had them kind of mediocre. And I remember somebody in the comments said, Mo has us at six and six. How you got us at six and six? <laughs> and now if I say, oh, the Raiders are going to be six and six at some point, they'll take it. But oh, my yeah. point to all oh, of this yeah. is you're absolutely right. We, we thought that Josh McDaniels coming in, Dave Ziegler coming in, would just pile on to what the Raiders did last year. Now, that's, that's easy to think because you're taking a roster and its core. You're extending core guys, Derek Carr, Darren Waller, Max Crosby, Hunter Renfro, and then you're adding notable pieces. Chandler Jones, yeah. who's come on the past two weeks, had a slow start. You're adding Devontae Adams. You're bringing in a new defensive coordinator who you think is better than your old defensive coordinators. You're moving Nate Hobbs outside thinking, yes, he can play inside and outside. Rock Yassin, you bring it in. A lot of people are hiring Rock Yassin. You know, so you're thinking, OK, we're building on what we had last year. But to your point, it takes a while to put the puzzle together. And I don't make excuses for the race because people know this. But I said this during the, the prediction show. I think our early bye week is good for the Raiders because whatever kinks they have to work out early in the season, they can work it out during the bye. Yeah, no, agreed. And and I think that, listen, I had somebody on our channel Again, from, from the post-game show, somebody who's watched the show for a long time, saying, you know, well, you guys are, you just, you're just ro um, rose-colored glasses, basically, right? You're just glossing over how bad this team is. And it's like, look, and, and I say that, and I say that to anybody watching, to Mo's point, because I think it's a really, really important point that you made, Mo, which is you give your opinion, whether people like it or not is up to them. And so... I told the commenter in the comments, I said, you know what? Then this probably isn't the show you want to watch. So I, I wish you the best of luck in finding a fanboy show or whatever it is that you want to watch. You want to watch angry men in a room screaming and pounding on walls? You'll find it. You want to find people talking about all this great stuff and how uh, Chandler Jones is an awesome player and he's worth $17.5 million without a sack? You can find it. And, and, and so I agree with you, Mo. I think you have to just give your opinion. It doesn't matter if you're a con if you're a fan. There's fans out there who are still positive. We, we deal with them all the time, right, who say, oh, I think we still can make the playoffs. Great. I don't think that's the case. I think they can still have a good season. I don't think they can make the playoffs. I really don't at this point, just the way they're playing. Now, that my mind might change in two weeks. I change my mind. I'm wrong all the time, and sometimes I'm right. I said they would be 4-1 and one at this point. No one's made fun of me for it. But that's what I said. I said they would go 4-0 and and then lose to the Chiefs. So I was right about the Chiefs game. That was it. So, so yes, 
I think that's where it's at. And I get it. They're so tired of waiting. But at the same time, it's not a magic wand. You don't wave it. Your, your best players are not playing their best ball, except for Josh Jacobs. Devontae Adams, I could argue, is for the most part. He didn't get the one foot down on Monday night, but so what? He's played well. So, so I think overall, you look at this team, and you should be disappointed, but not surprised. Does that make sense when I say disappointed, but not surprised? It makes sense, but like I said, like I've said before, when the expectations are high, yeah, disappointment comes a lot harder when you don't get <laughs> what you expect to see. But what I sure. will say is, I don't want to get on a soapbox about us back and forth with YouTube commenters. But what no. I will say, in, as as a part as a parting message is, what you're not going to find on this channel between Scott and I and even Murph. We're not going to get on here and say fire everyone after a loss. And I think that's what a lot of no, I think that's what a lot yeah. of fans that's wanted want. because and and I'm not chiding the fans for this because you know, there's emotion involved when you're a fan. So I sure. get it. When yeah. things don't go right, you're like, "Oh, bench this guy, fire this guy." But as professionals, as people who who it, we pride ourselves on objectivity and having a clear head, win or lose. Right. We're not going to get up here and go, yeah, Josh McDaniels deserves to be fired. Darren Waller should be traded or cut. We're not going to do that. We're just, we're just not that. If you're looking for that after a game, it's not going to happen. No, after a game, you're right. Now, if, if, if we were at a point where we thought one of those things should happen, we would say it. Right. Right. But we're not going to say it because we're disappointed that they lost to the Chiefs. Right. So, so I agree with you. And we have great listeners anyway. For the most part, they're not that way. So, so we're 90%, lucky 90%. 90% of our listeners are great. And I don't mind, I don't mind the bitching and the moaning after a loss. Like I expect it. And that's partly why we do a post game show, by the way. Yes. We would rather talk about all the rosy good things that happened and that they won, but when they don't win, that's why we always call it therapy session, right? Murph and his guys on, on Raiders fan radio, they had a therapy session where they were sitting in two comfy chairs. It was beautiful. It was really funny. Um, but also needed. So, so yeah, and, and I think that that's the thing that you have to look at now is say, okay, so one and four, you're not happy. Playoffs are difficult. Um, not impossible, difficult. And so, so where do you go from here? Look, every day you wake up as a Raiders fan, every day you wake up as a man or a woman, and you say, I'm either going to have a good day or I'm not going to have a good day. Now, things can happen to you that change your perspective and challenge you, but I just refuse to be part of, and I think most of our listeners are the same way, to be part of, I'm just going to make everything terrible, and I'm going to have a scorched earth approach. Now, we have great informed listeners who have great questions about people like Darren Waller, about Derek Carr, about Josh McDaniels, and their performance. And those, those are important questions to ask. And in watching the game film again, I watched it three times now, Mo. Um, there are important questions. There's still things with Derek Carr that are not going well. It's not his fault that they're losing, by the way, but he's part of the problem, as is the defensive front, as is the defensive backfield, as is the linebacker play, <laughs> as is the offensive line play. So it's not one person to blame. The world is not an easy place. It's not easy to identify one thing on a team with 50 plus men who are trying to win football games. So, so I get it. And, and rolling into this buy, I agree with you. I thought at first the early buy was bad because I thought they'd be four and one and have momentum. But now that it's the opposite, I think that's true. Mo, before we head to the break and then we're going to come back, we're going to have a conversation about one of those guys. And that's Darren Waller after the break. Um, but in watching the game again too, uh, what was, what was the biggest thing that surprised you uh, from a positive standpoint, and then what was the biggest thing that surprised you from a negative standpoint? I'll start with the negative. Um, the two young guys that I thought would stand out in the secondary, and, I, and I've said on this show that they would take big leaps. Nate Hobbs and Trayvon Merrick had to, they had an awful game. Yeah. And there's no, there's no other way to say it. Nate Hobbs, <laughs> right. I believe, gave up seven receptions on nine targets for over 100 yards. Yeah. Merrick gave up two touchdowns, of course, both to Kelsey, because Kelsey scored all their touchdowns. <laughs> but those two guys had a rough night. And Wait, there was somebody the, there was somebody covering Travis Kelsey? <laughs> apparently. Uh, or tried to. No, but I'm sorry those, to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, it's it's good because I mean, I looking at those two, and I expect a lot from those two yeah. this year, uh, their second year, 
they had a rough night. Now I think they'll bounce back. I hope that's not too positive for anyone listening. But I do think they bounce back. <laughs> but they definitely, definitely, uh, Patrick Mahomes definitely worked them in. Uh, they were they were both scored on or uh, gave up a lot of yards. Marquez Valdez Scanlon had a day, and a lot of that was on Nate Hobbs. From a positive standpoint, what surprised me is how well the offensive line has played in run situations. I know we've mm. had a lot of criticisms about the offensive line, but I think Josh Jacobs even said it uh, on Tuesday that he said the offensive line is blocking pretty well. They're opening up big holes for me. Huge. He said that out of his mouth. So if the guy running the rock is telling you the offensive line is blocking well in the run game, you got to believe it. And I saw it on tape. I saw it as I rewatched these games that even, even – Though they have lapses, you see Dylan Parham giving up a sack, giving up pressures. Uh, as far as going downhill and blocking for Josh Jacobs, that unit is performing very well right now going into the bye. Yeah, no question. Uh, it's it's one of those situations where you can find the positive, and I get it. It's This team still has to put together four quarters. Um, they're putting together real nice parts of games, and they just got to string them together. And so you got to hope that that's coming up uh, after this week, after the bye week when they when they play Houston. Uh, but we'll do that now. We're going to take our first break here on Silver and Black today. When we come back, we're going to ask the question, and we're going to say, Waller, Waller, Darren Waller, where are you? We're going to ask the question, what's going on with Darren Waller? Do we know what the problem is? Can we diagnose it? Should we be surprised by it? Should the Raiders have paid him all that money heading into this season instead of waiting a year. We'll talk about that. We'll also play you a clip uh, from a show I did uh, on the Mightier 1090 Silver and Black tonight this past offseason with Cynthia Freeland from NFL Network, and we talked about that too, so we're going to play you that clip right after the break. This is Silver and Black today. He is Mo. I am Scott. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, segment two, our Thursday edition. Thanks for being with us, Raider Nation. What are you going to do this weekend? No Raiders football. Now, coming off a loss, that's even worse, I know. But uh, get out and do something fun. Maybe donate your time to a charity. Go out with your buddies. Do whatever you got to do. Spend some time with the family. Uh, and we'll continue to talk Raider football with you. Mo Moten, Scott Branson, back with you on our Odyssey original podcast. Also, find us on YouTube. Subscribe and hit the notifications bell. And also subscribe and put on auto downloads for the podcast that helps us significantly. Mo and I would appreciate that greatly. You'll get the show every time we pump out an edition. Speaking of every time, uh, because the week's a little out of whack due to Monday Night Football, our mailbag show, which we usually do on Wednesdays, will now be tomorrow on Friday. So heading into your weekend, you'll get a little bit of our lighter fare uh, with Mo and I answering questions from Raider Nation and having some fun with all of you. So make sure you tune in to the show tomorrow. Okay, Mo. Let's jump into uh, what some people will love because it's it will be seemingly more negative and other people will uh, not like because it's a tough subject to talk about at this point, which is Darren Waller. So we look at Darren Waller and what's going on with him. Uh, it's hard to figure, uh, you know, the Raiders had the opportunity to lock him up to a longer term contract. They did that. We, you and I both, you more strenuously and I think vocally had said, listen, wait, there's no reason to hurry. He's got two years left on his deal uh, and he's not being a problem. So wait till this year, let him prove himself and then go out and pay him. Um, and so, so what's happened since then is they gave him the money and he's not been available and he's not performed well. He's had moments, but he's also had terrible moments where he's dropped important balls. He's knocked balls up in the air that were intercepted in the end zone, so on and so forth. Uh, when you look at this with Darren Waller, the question I'm going to, I'm going to ask the big question up front after five games, uh -oh. was this a bad deal for the Raiders to make at this moment, or is it just a bad break with Darren Waller in health? $17 million per year. Uh, is it? When you look at Darren Waller's production so far, is that what you expect when you pay a guy $17 million a year on a new contract? And I would answer emphatically, no. So right now, this is not a good look for the Raiders. Now, it's still early. You still have a lot of season left. But as you said, I said, Darren Waller at his age 
with his recent history of injuries, soft tissue injuries, he's got an ankle yes. here, he's got a hamstring here, he's got a back here. Pay him for 2022, or at least wait until the midseason if you're going to extend him to a multi-year deal. But pay him for 2022 and see how he does with new coaching staff, with a new system this season. Yeah. And a lot of people said, no, he's got to get the bag, give him his money. <laughs> and I get it. Two had two incredible, two great years, over 1,100 yards receiving, has a franchise record, I believe, catches over Tim Brown. I get it. But when you pay a player, ideally you want to play for future production. Yes. With a little bit of what he's done. Because if you continue to play players for what they did in the past, you're going to continuously overvalue guys. You have to play a player with the understanding that, okay, he did. this is what he did to earn it, the new check, but is he still going to give us premium production going forward? And with his injury history, you had to question it because it wasn't like this popped up out of nowhere. No. Since last offseason, I've been sounding like a broken record sentence. Since last offseason, he's had a litany of injuries, an ankle, a back, shoulder, hamstring, this, this, that. When you add up those things, you have to tread lightly with a with a with a guy like Darren Waller at his age with that injury history. And the Raiders chose to pay yeah. him, and now they're not getting the production. What I said post game, really quick, I want to say what I said post game was I wonder how severe this injury is because I think the Raiders could have benefited him from him being on the field as a decoy even because right. you still have to account for him as long as he's on the field. If he was hurt that bad that he couldn't even be on the field, to me that's that's a concern because people are saying, well, we hope Darren Wall is well after the bye. I'm not so sure about that with his injury history recently. <laughs> yes, and and the, the part about this too is the discussion. You were so right on with this. And so was Cynthia Freeland from NFL Network. When I had her on our nighttime show in Southern California uh, this past summer towards, towards training camp, I asked her the question, and I want to play this answer. It's a couple minutes long because she touches on a lot of the same subjects you made and made some other good points. So here's Cynthia Freeland from one of our earlier shows talking about whether or not the Raiders – should play or should pay Darren Waller heading into this this 2022 season or what else they could do with their money. So here's Cynthia Freeland. Uh, Cynthia, a couple other random Raider questions here. Uh, first of all, Darren Waller. So we're talking about Hunter Renfro. Everybody that follows the NFL knows the skill set that Darren Waller has. He's First of all, got a great story, of course, of what he overcame with substance abuse and all that stuff. But he's a fantastic athlete. He's a great player. He's a great receiver. Very hard to cover and to plan for. But he's had trouble staying healthy. He now is due for a raise, technically, if you look at what his production has been. Although the Raiders have to take care of some other issues. If you're the Raiders, would you prioritize signing him now? Uh, or with the two years left on his contract, do you take care of a Renfro, maybe try to fix that offensive line, and then maybe go to uh, Darren Waller next offseason and try to make good there? You know, it's interesting because I think that, you know, the two-year the two year contract guys right now are all across the league asking for their contracts to be renewed a bit early. But if they were smart, and I think that most of them are, you got to look at when the TV money times up because mm. the, ne the next biggest package is what's going to happen with the Sunday ticket, Sunday ticket, wherever it goes, whomever is the next person to get it. It's not going down in price. It's going up. So, you know, maybe waiting would be advantageous just for Waller. And maybe that's a win-win for the team because there are some areas that need to be improved and some money needs to be kind of spent and allocated in those areas so that everyone succeeds. But I actually think it could be a win-win here because by the time then Waller is up, then the money, then the, the salary cap for will have gone up. The salary cap will, ceiling will have gone up. So you'll have a chance then to reset and see kind of, and by the way, tight end marketplace is going to keep getting higher too, because there are more pass catching versatile, also blocking mm -hmm. tight ends with the kind of skill set that's an up and coming spot in the, in the roster and importance in the roster, as opposed to, you know, before where remember, I remember, you know, Jimmy Graham several years ago trying to get paid like a wide receiver it caused all these problems that ultimately led to him leaving the Saints. So now you have more of a precedent for like the Travis Kelsey, these guys who have multiple contracts because they are such effective and efficient pass catchers. So I think it's actually a win-win as long as Waller's not like upset and doesn't want to play, but he doesn't seem to have that attitude. So right. I think it actually could be a win-win all around because the O-line – I, I mean, I'm sorry, but the O line needs some help. The interior O line, you need, you need some help. I'm not being mean. <laughs> no, yeah, and, and 
There you go, Mo. I mean, she nailed it right there, right? At the very end, too. She said it several times about they need to spend money in other areas. But instead, they spent the money on up upgrading the contracts of all of those players. Now, Max Crosby was a good move. No question about that. But this Darren Waller deal, they spent no time or effort to go out and improve offensive line, but they paid Darren Waller. Um, you see her point, you heard her points there. It's hard to argue with that, and it rings true now four months later. How many times in this show have we, have I said Alex Bars is not the answer at guard? You put him <laughs> on the left side, you put him on the right side, not yeah. the answer. The Raiders apparently aren't high on John Simpson. He's been benched. Right. Uh, Andre James is a solid starter there. Now they want to bring along Dylan Parham. I get it, but can you imagine if they had a an upgrade at one of those positions on the interior or on the or at right tackle? How how good this team would look um, on you know through four quarters instead of in spots? Yeah. Now of course hindsight is always twenty twenty. We can always look back and say, yeah, should have spent on an offensive line. But as Cynthia just said it, she said it before the deal went down. Raiders should spend money on the offensive line. As we all, a lot of people would agree with me when I say this. You build the playoff team inside out. Yep. That means your offensive line. You have to trenches. win in the trenches. Yes. You have to Absolutely. be. You have to protect your quarterback. Open lanes for your running back on the offensive side, and you have to get to the quarterback. Stop the run on the defensive side. Now the Raiders' run defense has been better than I expected, but when the I and I watch the Chiefs game, when the Raiders don't get a pass rush, now Chandler Jones and Max Crosby did a good job. Don't get me wrong, getting a pass rush on Patrick Mahomes, but when those guys didn't get any pressure. That secondary, the back seven on the Raiders, isn't good enough to, to survive nope. when Max Crosby and Chandler Jones aren't getting a pass rush. No. It's evident right now. And I and I think highly of, again, I think highly of Nate Hobbs and Trayvon Merrick. I think they're going to be fine. But yeah. right now, as of today, going into a week six bye, that back seven is not good enough to survive without a decent pass rush. Well, and Mo, you saw it in the first half when the Raiders did do well with that pass rush and were getting to Patrick Mahomes consistently before the Chiefs had amazing halftime adjustments on offense and changed the whole game. They really did because there was there was pass rush, but it was not getting home like it was in the first half. It put all the pressure on the back seven, as you mentioned, and that was disastrous. But back to Waller. So we look at Darren Waller, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put up on the screen now um, the the pro, pro Football Reference uh, when we look at stats. You look at Darren Waller sitting there, uh, career seventy games. Uh, receptions 286, just under 3,500 yards with 17 touchdowns. Now, we all know his early career, what happened uh, going back to Baltimore in 2015. But you look at particularly the last uh, three seasons and counting, the, obviously, this season, the first five games. Mo, 2020, he goes to the Pro Bowl, 1,196 yards, 1,200 yards, basically. Uh, he gets nine touchdowns, has just a great year. Then last year plays just 11 games and, and uh, compiles half as many yards, 665 and only two scores so far through just under a third of the season this year, 16 receptions, 175 yards, one score. Now I know it's only been five games, my man, but uh, that's what, that's what you see when a player's, abilities are declining whether it's because of injuries or other things some players just fall off in the case of Darren Waller as you mentioned going back now uh, to last season uh, the last time he played 16 games was in 2019 he played 15 he missed one but was injured in three others in in 2020 uh, by the way even though he had a great year at 1200 yards uh, and then last year with the injuries, missing uh, six games, and then this year now missing one game and not performing great in the others, um, you're stuck, right, Mo? I mean, you're stuck. You just hope that they can revive him, uh, that he gets healthy, that the hamstring issue with another week off will be good, and that he gets his focus back. That's what has concerned me, not only the injuries, but throughout the course of the first four games – were the drops and and some of the seemingly um, easy things that he's done in the past that he just doesn't seem to be executing. Raiders fans might want to cover their ears when I say this, but <laughs> when people rank tight ends, right, and they say well, Travis Kelsey's on a level of his own, and then you have Darren Wall, you have Mark Andrews, George Kittle. I'm not too high on George Kittle because to me he's he's injured way too much for my way liking too much. as well. Yeah, but. 
I know Raiders fans are going to get upset when you compare Travis Kelsey and, and Darren Waller. But the reason the gap is so wide, not so wide, but the reason there's a significant gap between them is because of multiple things here. Travis Kelsey, to my knowledge, is usually available. <laughs> Can't say the same for Darren Waller over the last two years. The other thing that I, I wanted to point out when you had Darren Waller's stats up, what, you, what fans need to understand when you look at his statistics and all the box score looks great and everything, 1,100 yards looks fantastic, but he's only had one year with really good red zone production. Now, I know he was on bus with the boys, and he basically said that John Gruden didn't have a plan for him in the red zone. But even after John Gruden had to resign because of his emails, and now this year with well and his drops, still not as effective in the red zone, not nearly right. effective in the red zone as Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey – had four touchdowns in that one game. I think that's more than Darren Wallace had. What in 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 how, what has he had in the last two years? Three, three, three touchdowns. So Travis Kelsey eclipsed that in one game. football game. Yes. yes, that's what separates a great tight end from a really good one. Right, a tight end that's going to get you in the end zone. A tight end you can depend on when you're inside the 10, 20. I know it's crowded inside the ten and twenty. A lot of big bodies in there, but you know what? Travis Kelsey gets it done. And I don't want to absolve Derek Carr because Derek Carr's red zone passing isn't great either. Let's be honest about that. But the pattern with Waller is one year with really good red zone production or touchdown production. I believe he had nine touchdowns in one year. Other than that, not reliable inside the 20. No, not reliable inside the 20. And you look at the number of receptions, you go back to that big year in 2020 where Darren Waller had 107 receptions, the only time he ever had 100-plus receptions. Then in 2021, I know he missed six games, but he, he just 55 receptions. Remember, even before the injury, Mo, he was not playing that great. He had some issues. I don't know if it was the injuries that were lingering and it started because that is a, a more debilitative injury that, that, that um, stretches out over time. But he went, his production was cut exactly in half last year exactly in half so coming off a year where he was injured missed six games and put up half the numbers he did the previous year they gave him the race and so again i know all the fans want to give guys money all that they can because they love them but in reality from a football decision standpoint this one could really haunt this offensive team they might be they might be prevented even with the cap going up and all that from going out and getting that extra player next year because of now having to pay Darren Waller. Here's what drives me nuts. And I don't want to say <laughs> just fans say this because I hear, I hear analysts say this too. What do I care what they pay a player? It's not my money. Right. And that, that, that drives me nuts because if you understand the way the cap works, if you understand the way money works, if you understand the way uh, these rosters work, you play a certain guy, big money, that takes away money from other places. So you may not care what you know what the team pays them because it's not your money. But guess what? When you overpay a guy, that hurts you from signing another guy who can help you at a weak position. Now you talked about the linebacker core. We talked yep. about you know the secondary, other areas that you can improve if instead of playing while it doesn't happen out because you've paid him. Can't take it back. Not your money, but guess what? Waller has that money, can't take it back. Now you have to bargain bin shop if you need help <laughs> at other spots. It's not ideal. But back to Waller, just focusing on him. I don't. I don't want to make it seem like we're we're coming down just on him because he's not the only issue right now. But when you have a guy coming in, <laughs> and he's had these injury issues, and usually you pay a guy after a a good or really good year. That's ideally what you want. You want a guy right. coming off of a great year. Now, of course, you have the one, the one year wonders, the guys who flash only in a contract year. That's an issue too. But sure it is. ideally, you you don't want to pay top dollar to a guy who's coming off of an injury riddle season and was inefficient. To me, it just didn't make sense. And this is why I campaigned to either wait till the middle of the season or pay him for just this year. Because if it if it went sideways as it's going right now, then you can say, okay, we we're on the hook for 2022. But guess what? We can pivot in 2023. Right now, you're on the hook for multiple years, and it looks like a mistake right now. We'll see what happens after the buy, but he has to pick it up. Right, and and the thing is, you have a young tight end behind him in Foster Moreau. Now, Foster Moreau, it's hard to say because you know concussion is a concussion, right? It can happen, 
But Foster Moreau's had injury problems too. And so, so he's had, t- he's had a tough time staying out there. Uh, and, and hopefully he recovers from the concussion quickly and can get back out there because they need him. But Darren Waller's inability to get on the field against Kansas City, Murph said it was the, the reason he felt they lost the game. Uh, it certainly was one of them. I agree with him there. And, and, and you got to be able to do it. And, and listen, Darren Waller has to stay healthy. He has to prove it out. The fans are down on him. They just are. And, and, and I can understand why. They all stuck up for him, wanted him to get paid and all that jazz. And it happened, and they haven't seen anything for it. So I think this time off, Mo, is going to be huge for him and for this team because they need, they need him to win. I really believe that. If they're going to turn the season around and at least make a run at the playoffs, no matter how serious it is, they're going to have to get production out of that position. You know in Josh McDaniel's offense how important it is, and right now they don't have anybody. So I have a feeling we won't see anything this week, but going into next week, if the Raiders go out and activate or sign another tight end, that's going to be a terrible sign for them. Yeah, absolutely. It means that they don't think Darren Waller is close to coming back or he's going to miss multiple games. But what I will say is this. I don't, one thing I want to make clear is that, and I see this out there, and there are a lot of people questioning Darren Waller's passion for the game. Oh, he doesn't want to play. I, I would be careful with those type of statements because you don't know what's going on in a guy's head. You don't know, you know what he's thinking. I don't want to say Darren Waller is not invested in the team because to me, his teammates will have a better answer for that. They, sure. they are, they're around him in the locker room. They see him every almost every day. They know if he's motivated or not. I'm not going to judge that all the way from New York City across the country. But what I will say is that whatever is going on with him has to be straightened out during the bye because if it's not, it's going to look like one of the worst signings of the offseason if he doesn't pick it up after week six. No question. All right, we're going to take our second break as we finish up our Darren Waller conversation, and uh, we're going to transition into some just general thoughts about the Raiders as they head into this bye. And then don't forget, we will have our mailbag show tomorrow. We'll preview that as well. You're listening to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original podcast with Scott and Mo. We'll be back right after this. It is Silver and Black Today. Mo Moten, Scott Branson back with you as we bring you home on this Thursday. We hope you're having a good week, getting ready for the weekend and whatever you got going up. Start your weekend tomorrow, by the way. Our mailbag show will drop first thing in the morning. So you can listen to that. Some great questions again this week, as well as uh, some chatter between Mo and I on all sorts of things. By the way, Mo, I I would be remiss. It's a really, really big moment in your life, and that is you are finally in the win column in fantasy football. <laughs> right? Did you see? It? Yes. Did you actually see? <laughs> I actually changed. You changed my your name. Team name. Yes. Until until I get back over 500, I am no longer Mostradamus. My team name is now Tim Brown's Pep Talk. Tim Brown's. Shout out to Kelly Kreiner. And if you saw last week or listened to last week's show, you heard the great Hall of Famer Tim Brown from the University of Notre Dame uh, come on and give Mo a pep talk and call Kelly yes. a woman. It was awesome. If you missed that show, go back and find out. By the way, you won't miss a show if you subscribe to the damn show. So so wherever you get your podcast, (laughs) subscribe, put on auto, download, and you'll get it pushed right to you. Uh, But, Mo, congratulations on your win. I would congratulate myself on my win, but I do it every week, so it's just kind of normal. So um, we we continue to roll on, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that more a little bit on the mailbag show as well. Um, Mo, Raiders head into this bye week. They got to get healthy. We see that injury list was pretty big, um, and and there's some guys we talked about Darren Waller last segment ad nauseum. Of course, uh, other folks that need to get healthy too. Uh, that's what that week is for. But this Raiders team has got to go, as does its coaching staff. The players got to do some some soul searching, looking in the mirror, looking at one another, talking to one another. The coaching staff has to go back to the drawing board a little bit and figure out how they're going to put together a game plan against Houston in a week and a half that will give them a chance to win and give them a chance to play a complete football game. In your experience in covering the league, when you see a team like this that's underperforming mostly for the talent they have and they're not stringing four quarters together, what what is that issue and what can coaching staffs do in order to get the team back on track? 
I would say typically, usually there's a disconnect between the players and the coaching staff. That's one. Mm. Two, sometimes the players aren't clicking within themselves, meaning the coaches aren't on the field. <laughs> it's the players who have to get it together and they have to work together. They have to communicate and do all those things to make sure everything's running properly. And I think Derek Carr said it a couple of weeks ago. And he said practice. He talked about practice again. And if you're not running it right at practice, guess what? <laughs> it's not going to go right on the field on game day. Right. And and I, I'll go back to something Josh McDaniel said this week. I, I think even he said, look, why are we closing out games? I think the question was asked when report asked him, you know, what's the problem with the Raiders not being able to close out football games? The Raiders have lost two games with at least a 17-point lead. Cardinals, yes. they're up 20-0. Chiefs, they're up, they were up 17. And basically, Josh McDaniel said, well, we got to get back to the practice field. We got to work on the details. And I think Josh, uh, Josh Jacobs also mentioned details. And he said this last year was about details. And to me, over the past few years for the Raiders, it's been about details. And my question would be, well, what's going on with the details on the practice field? Are you guys just <laughs> not completing plays? Or are you guys not communicating properly? Because to me, the word details comes up so often with this team when – People ask why they can't finish. Why aren't they, you know, winning more games? It's always, oh, attention to detail. We got to go back to the practice field. What is going on at these practices that is not translating to the field? That would be my question. It, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know, um, and 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 certainly that's where you, you get you see the argument amongst fans on social media about where the blame lies. And often, oh, McDaniels is an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, these players suck, and Carr sucks, and he sucks, and that guy sucks, and his his dad sucked, and his grandfather sucked. You know, it's all that stuff. But in reality, there's 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 a mix of that, right? There's some coaching issues, there's some player issues. The players need to dig down to your point, find it, click with one another. If if there's a room there, if it's a wide receiver room, if it's the if it's the offensive line, and then you got to spend time together and gel better so they play better. Whatever it is, you got to find it, though. But <clears throat> there's one question that's nagging at me, and I shouldn't say nagging, but but has crossed my mind, and I want to get your thoughts on this, which is, you know, you come into a situation, like I've taken a job where I inherited a staff, or I created a staff and hired people. Um, you hire people, they totally work out, and you you're, you look brilliant. You hire other people, they're not the right people, and so then you got to figure out, okay, I'm going to give them a chance. Um, I'm going to, you know, tell them they need to improve A, B, and C. And if they don't improve A, B, and C, then you move on, right? So you manage them out, as it's uh, talked about in the business world. With this team, from a player perspective and from a coaching perspective, could some of that be coming into play? You know, you inherit a roster. They added some of their own players, but they also have players that they didn't draft, that they didn't sign, that they had to keep. They couldn't go replace everybody, and they didn't want to. Uh, but could there just be some of these guys, Mo, that are counted on that might not be the right fit for the culture and for the system they're building? I think it's a great point. I, I know some fans are going to hear that as an excuse, but you said no. it in the first segment. You said it in the first segment that this is not necessarily a build-on from what the Raiders had last year. This is a new staff, new systems. So, of course, as you said, can't replace everyone, so you keep some of the players that you know are not going to be around beyond this year, but you work with them for just this year until you can replace them in the draft, in free agency. So I think, yes, there are some players on the roster that the Raiders aren't high on, but they say, look, we'll work with them for this year, but this is not going to work long term. Right. And what happens is you're not going to get the best results from players that don't fit in your system. I know what fans are going to say. If you're a good coach, you have to fit a player's strengths to your system, not the other way around. But what I will say is that in an ideal world, yes, that's true. But you just can't do that for everyone. Certain mm -hmm. players just can't do things that you need done in your system. And you just can't replace them yet until the offseason. And that's the reality of it. But what I will say is one person that we haven't mentioned during any of these segments that needs to step it up as a coach from a coaching standpoint, Patrick Graham. The Raiders offense, the Raiders defense in the red zone is atrocious. They've allowed yes. 14 touchdowns on 17 attempts. <laughs> It seems like any time a team gets within 20 yards of the goal line, they're making it in there. Yeah. He has to do he has to switch something up. I don't know what it is, but he has to switch something up because the Raiders have to learn to tighten up closer to the red zone because if they don't do that and a team just gets in close and they're just letting guys in, hey, free club, everyone in, no payment, up, oh, bring your own buzz, bring it over whatever. Let let them all in. 
can't have that against good offensive teams because high power teams are going to run up the score on you. They're going to score 30 plus points. Right. And and in the division with Patrick Mahomes, I mean, you just might as well make yourself 0-2 if that's how you're going to play. Now, I think the defense has gotten better in spots, but from a scheme perspective and to your point about what happens in the red zone, what happens on third down, uh, not good. So so you're absolutely right. The Patrick Graham needs to do some soul searching and talk to his staff about what they need to do. But the the point, and, and you made a good point about, hey, you can't make a guy play a certain way if he doesn't play that way. And I think, too, it gets down to also personality. There's some guys that just aren't going to fit with what the coach wants to do. Uh, and to me, there, there could be guys like that. Doesn't mean that they're not okay players. Sure, they might be a player you'd upgrade if you have an opportunity. But there's some guys that just aren't going to buy into what you're selling. I mean, it just happens that way. I don't care what kind of leader you are. Um, so you have to surround yourself and get those people in there. And I think the Raiders probably have some. I think that's what I'm hearing and I'm, I'm deducing, okay, I'm making my own assumptions, let me say that straight up, that when Derek Carr says things like, well, there's some guys, I think there's just some guys who are like, yeah, whatever, I'm not going to buy into that. Now, maybe it's because they're Gruden guys, maybe it's just because that's how they are, I don't know. But, but I think that that's why, if I'm a Raiders fan, I understand being upset, but I would preach some patience, because, and, and, and we'll talk about that now, because they have a stretch now of three games where I, I believe, and I'm going to say it today on the show, so if I'm wrong, I said they were going to go 4-1 and one to start the season, and I was dead wrong. But I believe, Mo, they're going to go 3-0 and oh over the next three games. I really do. You saw multiple clips this week from national um, players, coaches, and prognosticators on NFL Network, ESPN, all the networks, saying how the Raiders are way better than their record. Now, um, that still doesn't address the issues they have to address. But I do think that if I'm a Raiders fan, all things aside with playoffs, because I don't even want to talk about it right now, but, but you have the opportunity to, three weeks from today, as we're talking on this show, to be at four and four. And I expect them to be there. So, so don't you feel like this team has the opportunity to turn it around because of that favorable schedule as well. And I talked about it during the post game. People probably don't want to hear it because they're going to say it's too positive, but you can only look forward. You can't look backward now unless you're correcting mistakes. And I'm not it. in the Raiders. You can't change it. They're one in four. So let's look right. ahead. What What is on the slate coming up? How can they turn this around? And I read out the, the, the opponents that they had. Their next, to me, their next six games are all winnable. Now, of course, you don't win games on paper. But as you said, um, they're probably going to be favored in most, if not all of those games for the next six games until they play the Chargers again. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's if you're going to be if you're going to be a playoff team. One trait of a playoff team is they beat the teams that they're supposed to beat. I know any given Sunday, anything can happen, injuries, whatever. Right. But if you're going to be a playoff team in this league, you should beat teams you're favored against. If you can't do that, if you're losing to bottom tier teams, you're not sniffing the playoffs. No. And I, I think the Raiders are going to win. At, I won't say three straight. I would say if they can win three of the next four, be four and five, then you get Denver, who's still, as I said, a mess. Seattle. You know, you get you get Seattle. You get the you get you know the Chargers at home. Yeah. You could turn it around, but but it has to start apparently as far as what Josh McDaniels has said, it has to start on the practice field and they have to dial in because if they lose, if they come out and they lose against the Texans, and I'll say this on the show now today, if they lose against the Texans, I'm out. They're not, <laughs> they're not making 500. They get, if they come out of, and, and I understand they're top, the Texans they're top gotta, three draft pick if they lose to Houston. It, it, and I, and I understand the Texans have a buy as well. Both the Raiders and the Texans have an extra week to prepare for each other. So they are on equal footing. Yep. If they come out of the bye and they're flat or yep. they fall behind or they play a half or a one good quarter, I'm out. Like, that, <laughs> I don't want to say it's rebuild time, but something is amiss. pretty damn close. If you, if you had two weeks to prepare for the Houston Texans and you don't win that game, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I mean, you look at this too and you say to yourself, yeah, you have Houston, you go to New Orleans, so it is a road game. I get that. I think that's a tough one. 
but the New Orleans is not a good team. They're not a good football team. And they're not coached well either, by the way. And so you you look at those games, and if I'm the Raiders and I can string together those three wins in Jacksonville's the week after in Las Vegas, or no, yeah, no, that's in, that's in Jacksonville, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. If you can go beat Houston at home, then go on the road and win two in a row, you know, you, you feel really good about yourself. And, and but but I agree. I, I think listen, I think two out of three would be great, three out of three even better. But if you're one in three, it's I agree with you, it's done. And 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 this team is is too good for that. And I think I think if you're if you're Dave Ziegler too, the next the next six weeks will determine what next year looks like. I really believe this, Mo. Because mm-hmm. People were asking about Derek Carr. And when I say that I believe Derek Carr will not be the quarterback of the Raiders next year if they don't make the playoffs, that's not because I don't think Derek Carr is a good quarterback. I, I'm looking at it from a pure business decision. Because if the Raiders don't make the playoffs this year, you can't justify paying the quarterback. And you have to find money to go out and improve your offensive line and improve your defensive line and improve at linebacker. You have a lot of holes to fill if this team can't achieve what everyone thought it could. And so that to me is it's not a full rebuild necessarily, but it's a retooling and it's a pretty deep one, uh, especially when you start talking about quarterbacks. But this this next six weeks, I think, determines the future of a couple key players on this squad. Do you agree with that or you disagree? Yeah, I totally agree because it's the, it's the it's the meat of the season. They usually say and the old saying goes around the NFL. What you are around Thanksgiving is what you're going to be. Because Thanksgiving yeah. is when teams start to turn it up. You start to get closer to the playoffs. You know, most teams have already gone through their bye week. So there's no break there. You're right. dialed in f- for the remainder. And and whatever you are at that point, that's where you're going to end up. Now, the Raiders, remember, they had that, that Thanksgiving win against the Cowboys that I feel like kind of sparked them last year, even yes. though they were depleted roster. So you remember that. Yes. Huge November win. is a pivot. November is a pivotal month, but before we even get to Thanksgiving, I, I think we should also look at the trade deadline. Are the Raiders going to make a move for a cornerback if a couple of other guys get banged up? Anthony Avery is still on IR. Are they going to make a move for another linebacker? Are they going to make a move for an offensive lineman at that point? Because I think if you feel like you are pushing for a playoff spot, you continue to be aggressive and you make a move. If you feel like, not that you don't have a chance, but that it's going south pretty quickly, and the Raiders start selling players, that will also tell you where the front office thinks the team is, is headed. Yeah, and and what's the day of the trade deadline again, Mo? You remember? No, November 1st. November 1st. Okay, so so we, we got a few weeks to go. Uh, and so that's mm-hmm. that's it. I mean, to your point, you lose to Houston and lose to New Orleans or, or even just losing to Houston would be terrible. But if you lose yes. like two out of those three games, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a tough business, man. You, you can't. They they went all in on the guys they had and and so they got to come through. I mean that's just the bottom line. You got to perform. You got to do it now. Uh, you got to make a push for that playoff again uh, and have this team go. I don't know that it will. We'll have to see. The next few weeks will definitely determine that. Here's the one variable I'll put out there though okay. that's gonna that could make things difficult. Okay. Let's say, and I, I don't want to speak this into existence, but what if Darren Waller is not back after the bye? What if Devontae Adams, what if the league suspends Devontae Adams for shoving that that camera person? <laughs> and you don't have Darren Waller or Devontae Adams. So you're depending solely on Hunter Renfro in the passing game. Hopefully, maybe you fall some rows back and Josh Jacobs on the ground. To me, you should still be able to beat the Texans. <laughs> but if you're yeah. sure, but if you're shorthanded, and it, it's just gonna make things more difficult. And this sure. goes back to my point about some some things are on the players. Now, yeah. Devonta Adams has been a model citizen for most of his life. I, I, I've Absolutely. heard, right? I don't know Devonta Adams, but from what I've heard, great guy. This is mm-hmm. out of character for him, but this is the kind of mistake that can hurt you in the season. Because Correct. what if? Okay, let's say he doesn't get suspended for the Texas game, but he's suspended later on for another crucial game, a game that you will really need him for. That's a problem. And I like Devonta Adams, but he made a poor decision. Oh yeah. He made a poor decision. And listen, I'm with the side that says, oh, come on, suspend it. I don't think he yeah. should be suspended. I think he's going to get a hefty so. fine. Mm-hmm. But but I also, since we got on the Devontae Adams, I have to talk about it now. Um, I also completely disagree and get disgusted by those of you out there who think it was no big deal. Yes, 
There's been great points made. The photographer should not have been there. Okay. He was violating the protocol of the tunnel, the players coming off the field. So Devonte Adams gets up to him and he's in the way. You can simply stop and say, dude, get out of my way. You're not supposed to be here. You don't have to push him. I don't care if it was a light push. I don't care if it was a love tap. Okay. You don't do it. It was a poor decision. And to your point, it's the kind of poor decision that reminds me of the team under Gruden when we saw the COVID protocol breaking and all that kind of stuff. So, so you're right. It could hurt you. But you're, that's where you're in this precarious position now where if you have a suspension, and again, I don't think it'll happen, but you never know, um, then suddenly you're that. And what if Foster Moreau's not back from his concussion and, and Darren Waller's not back? And oh, by the way, it goes without saying, we talked about it a few weeks ago before he, when he got hurt about the fumbles and Hunter Renfro. Hunter Renfro hasn't been the same player this year either. Why? I don't know. Okay? It's just... Maybe it's part of the, the system and getting used to every. I don't know why, okay? But he's not the same player. He doesn't look like the same player. He's not making the same plays he did when he's in there. So, so that offense that was supposed to really jet this team has had brilliant moments, but it's not there yet, and it goes down to executing as players, staying healthy on that side of the ball too. And so... There's a lot of worries here. I'm not trying to get everybody freaked out. I'm, I'm still telling people they should stay positive. But but there are a lot of question marks. And the point is, in the next three to four weeks, you're going to see a lot about the character of this team, a lot about its ability to fight back uh, again, even at, like they did last year. One closing point I want to make, too, about the AFC West division has been, to me, overall, has been a disappointment. But, yeah. you know, the one team that's at the top of the division, the Chiefs, you know what they have in place. No matter what players they have on the field, a great coaching staff. No one's questioning whether Andy Reid is a good coach or not. If you look at the Denver Broncos, Nathaniel Hackett doesn't even know when to kick a field goal or give the football to his quarterback. Right. Brandon Staley is still going for it on his side of the field on fourth down when he shouldn't. <laughs> boneheaded play. Boneheaded play call. I don't understand now, it. Now, Josh McDaniels, to me, wasn't the fault why the Raiders lost on Monday, but we all know it took some time for Josh McDaniels to fit in the run game and balance the offense. He's going to tell you, yeah, we were behind, we were behind, we were behind, but to me, Josh Jacobs should have been getting fed early in games because the Chargers, as I've said this, the Chargers still have one of the worst run defenses in the league. He should have <laughs> came out of the gate. He should have came out of yep. the gate running the football. So what I, my point is that with these other teams, and just like the Raiders now, we are questioning the coaching staff. Some people are, right? Yeah. Yep. One thing you're not questioning about the Chiefs, their coaching staff. They right. have their players in place. Their guys look the same from year to year. Some guys that you thought were, were going to underperform, <laughs> overperform. And with the Raiders, we're asking, why doesn't Hunter Renfro look the same? Why doesn't Darren Wall look the same outside of his injuries, of course? Why doesn't this play look the same? Why doesn't that play look the same? When you look at the good football teams, notice the stars perform. They look the same from for the most part from year to year. But you're yep. not getting that from the Raiders. And you, you just brought up that point that sent me off on a tangent, but it's something to question. It's good point. Hunter Renfro, Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller, why aren't they the same players with a guy that's going to demand double coverage in Devontae Adams right. downfield? Those players should be better not taking a step back. And both of them got new deals, right? So they got paid. So from an off-the-field mm -hmm. perspective and feeling appreciated, mm -hmm. they should feel good. And we all feel good when we get a raise after doing a good job, right? So we want to continue to perform well. So I'm not I'm not saying they don't want to continue to perform well. I'm sure they do, but it's a question to ask. And I'm glad you brought that up and went down that that uh, that rat hole there because it's important to ask. And and you're right about coaching. As much as Raiders fans love to give crap to other coaches, and it's all part of the game. It's all part of fanhood, which is awesome. Um, Andy Reid just gets it done, man. I and you know what? He's laughing because he's looking at the rest of his division and saying, "I thought this was going to be a little more difficult." And it hasn't been so far for them. So we'll see where it goes. But the Raiders have some time to get healthy. The Raiders have some time to maybe make some personnel decision uh, changes, which I think they will do, Mo, over the next week. I think we're going to see some guys come in and go out um, and, and, and see if they can improve in certain areas. And we'll also learn about these injuries like Waller's injury, like Moreau's injury and others. Uh, you talked about Anthony Averett, too. He's been out. Uh, they sorely need him as well. So we'll see all that's out. But first, tomorrow we're going to do a mailbag show, which you and I always love doing. Uh, and then next week during the bye week, 
we'll, we'll shrink down by one show, but we'll still have uh, the three shows. We just won't have a post game show. So we'll have our Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with the mailbag sandwiched in between the two shows. And then, of course, if anything breaks, if something happens, Mo and I will climb on and do a show as well uh, to talk about it. But, Mo, we have wrapped up our Thursday edition a little bit longer. Uh, we seem to be going a little bit longer this last week because lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. A lot of therapy session to get out. I'm sure fans are going to get in the comments <laughs> and scream at us either way. Uh, just understand that we, we do enjoy the back and forth, the interactions, whether positive or negative. Um, we always enjoy discussion. So yes. be active in the chat. We enjoy that. Um, you know, there are 10%. There's always a 10% crowd that's, you know, undesirable. But <laughs> for the most part, Raider Nation <laughs> comes to support. And and it's fun. It's always fun. Just don't take it as a negative. Just like you you come at us for our opinions, you know, we, we come back and we have an answer for it. And then that's, <laughs> that's the beauty of sports discussion of sports talk, that we can disagree and then go about our business and say, hey, at least, look, we're, we're focusing on the Raiders. This is about the Raiders. It's not about a personal attack. It's about what we see on the field. And you just have different opinions. That's all. Absolutely. And I got no problem with Raider fans being mad. Like, they should yeah. be mad. I get it. Yeah, and I'm okay be. with it. But if you're mad about something stupid, I'll tell you. Just like if I say something stupid, feel free to tell me. I, I got no problem with it. My wife does it all the time. She tells me all the time. What are you talking? No, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, uh, we appreciate you guys being with us as always. All right, we're going to say goodbye for now. Uh, but we will be back, of course, as I mentioned, tomorrow with our mailbag show. So make sure you do that with us. Oops. If I can get this all straight away. Uh, and uh, until then, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends to subscribe to the podcast. Get, you know, if your parents have a phone, just go on their phone and subscribe to the show. Even if they don't listen to it, put us on auto download. It'll help us a lot so we can do it. And then they're going to call you and say, why am I getting this great show with these two handsome men that are talking about football? And they're so intelligent and they're always right. That's what you're going to get the call from. So so make sure you do that for us. If you're on YouTube, thank you for joining us and, and, and interacting with us in the live chat. We enjoy that as well. Uh, but uh, do that for us. Hit the notifications bell on YouTube so you know when we're live. For Mo Moten, I am Scott Branson. This has been the Thursday edition of Silver and Black Today. We'll talk to you tomorrow for our mailbag. Take care, everybody.